Hello and welcome to Showcase, TRT World's flagship arts and culture program. Later on the show, we'll venture through the culture-mashing world of Turkish Cypriot artist Aylin Örek and take you to a place where you're likely to find your next great read. But we'll begin by taking a special look at one of the most influential art movements of the past century. The sounds of a centenary. A hundred years later, the Bauhaus art movement is still inspiring the world and challenging conventions. Those conventions also include cinema. We'll take a look at Bauhaus's influence on the silver screen. With its industrial outlook and minimalist approach, the emergence of Germany's Bauhaus movement shook the foundations of the art world in 1919. It also helped pioneer much of the design we now take for granted in the modern world. 100 years of Bauhaus is being celebrated with events throughout Germany. TRT World's Ira Spitzer went to Berlin to see for himself. Functional design a fusion of form and purpose. At its core, simplicity. These are some of the design principles that define and give character to the modern world. We're introducing iPhone 4. Many trace the origins of that style back a hundred years to the founding of Germany's influential Bauhaus school. Erstmal ist das Bauhaus Bauhaus is first of all an idea of collaboration between artists and craftspeople, and then later between artists, craftspeople and industry. In 1919, German architect Walter Gropius founded the Bauhaus School in the city of Weimar. Its mission? To reimagine the relationship between art and society. Bauhaus was a school where you have to understand that most of the teachers and most of the students, everyone in fact that took part, came out of the First World War, out of the absolute chaos of that war. They were in a country that, while not completely destroyed, was in upheaval, and they wanted to apply that upheaval to building, to the arts and to culture. The emergence of mass production techniques and their worries that art would lose its relevance played a key role in the way that the Bauhaus School saw the world and their work, inspiring them to create objects like these chairs and lamps that were radically different from much of what had come before. The Bauhaus School lasted only 14 years until 1933 when it was shut down by the Nazi government who considered much of the work so-called degenerate art. But as a result of persecution by the Nazis, many key Bauhaus figures went abroad where they spread their techniques and ideas to the rest of the world. That influence and Bauhaus's centenary are celebrated throughout the year, beginning with an opening kickoff party in Berlin, exploring the movement's experimental theater. A week-long festival that will present all sorts of events, you know, immersive art, theater plays, installations, performances, um, lectures. Later this year, another Bauhaus museum will open in the city of Dessau, and Berlin is planning on holding a Bauhaus week in September. As well, fans of the movement will have their pick of more than 500 exhibitions in just about every corner of Germany. In some ways, it feels like Bauhaus is bigger now than ever. I think it's very relevant today and important um, because the global expansion of Bauhaus illustrates the power of utopian ideas to transform a conservative order. And I think this sends an incredibly important message of hope uh, in, the very, in, the, in, in our century. For Germany too, because Bauhaus was something that inspired pride after the horrors of the Nazi regime. I believe Bauhaus is very important for Germany and Berlin because it represents the very best of Germany. Modernity, innovation, um, openness, diversity. And at a time um, in Berlin where it was closed by the worst, by the Nazis. 
We'll never know how the movement's founders would judge the modern era, but one thing is clear, the Bauhaus aesthetic still does seem to pop up everywhere, from the fonts we use to the furniture in our living room. It's a standardized, mass-produced design. There are still many aesthetic elements in modern furniture that can be traced to Bauhaus, such as a sense of simplicity or minimalism. Even at the age of 100, the Bauhaus style still inspires the world to keep on looking. Iris Spitzer, TRT World, Berlin. When it came to looking, the Bauhaus philosophy couldn't just be seen in urban architecture and other crafts, but was also brought to life on celluloid. But the use of the movement's ideals and aesthetics within the medium of film was at times very problematic. Showcase's very own Ali Can Pamir explains why. It can be said that one of the ways the Bauhaus modern design movement reached those who can't afford travel to see it firsthand was via mass entertainment, and in particular, cinema. Given its Germanic roots, it's no surprise that the first significant representation of Bauhaus design in film just happens to be the 1927 Berlin backlot production, Metropolis. This dystopia set sci-fi tale looks at a war between social classes who are defined by the spaces they inhibit, with the ruling class living in highly stylized skyscrapers and the working class literally residing underground. Director Fritz Lang, whose father was a municipal architect, uses this premise to critique the modernization of society. And since at the time Bauhaus represented modernization, Lang uses the language of architecture to criticize society itself. In the film, the geometrical arrangement of the set designs lent to an overall mechanical, cold and soulless aesthetic, suggesting that those who inhibit these spaces must be the same. When it came to Hollywood, the Bauhaus aesthetic made its presence known by way of émigré filmmakers from Germany and Austria, and its existence is felt the strongest in Austro-American director Edgar Ulmer's 1936 horror movie, The Black Cat. The film tells the story of an Austrian architect, Palzig, living in Hungary, committing a series of ritualistic murders within his Bauhaus-inspired home. Ulmer, who himself trained to be an architect, presents the evil protagonist as a person, haunted by his past as a traitor during the Great War. In the story, Polzig's home is a catacomb filled with bodies of loved ones, and in the end, the whole structure is blown up by his former adversaries from the war. The film's use of a highly stylized Bauhaus design suggests that nostalgia is a notion that cannot exist alongside modernism, hence the destruction of it at the end of the movie. And with the dark rituals committed in it, the black cat makes an additional statement that modernist spaces are breeding grounds for twisted ideals that don't resonate with the values of the day. The second half of the 1900s saw cinema's award-winning satirist, Jacques Tati, taking a shot at Bauhaus. His 1967 comedy, Playtime, came out when radical changes in urban planning and technology were commonplace. And these innovations were being infused into the daily lives of the everyday people, whether they liked them or not. The film's main lead, the clumsy Monsieur Hulot, is an avatar for John Q. Public and his interactions with the now commonplace Bauhaus architecture and new technologies often result in absurd failures. With Playtime, Tati parodies the disappointment of man with modernism, even in the age of design and technological advancements, and ultimately raises the question of whether or not modernist principles are applicable in real life.
starting from humble beginnings, Eileen Orek has lived and worked in half a dozen countries. Considered one of the leading artists of the Turkish Cypriot community, Örek's work reflects her desire to share her culture with the world, while simultaneously traveling around the globe to experience other cultures firsthand. And as showcases Adil Halim discovered, her work extends beyond man-made borders. Eileen Örek doesn't like to swoop into a country, paint and take off. The Turkish Cypriot artist prefers to live and work in a country to understand the people, their customs and traditions. But she started from humble beginnings. She has created her own way. Uh, you will see from, the, uh, from her design and sketches and patterns that uh, they are very different, uh, that she uses lots of uh, colors uh, from, uh, from Cyprus. Uh, the blues, the yellow, the green, and whatever, uh, whatever she has seen there. And uh, also the orange, the, that you, the orange color uh, she's uh, using. And exactly, uh, it's, uh, it is, you, you can say that it's from a Mediterranean uh, location, Mediterranean island. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, she has developed her own skills and the unity, the originality of her painting made many. Uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to prove uh, her works. Born in Lefkosia in 1941, Oryk began painting in high school. She was the first Cypriot artist to receive a scholarship from the Istanbul Academy of Fine Arts. She then went on to continue her education in Paris and Marseille after receiving a scholarship from the French government. Her work describes Cypriot culture in fairy tale fashion through social panorama, rituals, and daily life in Cyprus. But her career choice was often met with roadblocks along the way. It was the year of uh, 1974 uh, during, the, uh, during the war. Uh, she had to come back and she had to cut her studies and she had to come back to, to, to be with her family. And then uh, it was quite a journey uh, where she came uh, with lots of uh, artworks uh, with her uh, back to the island. But the exhibit's curator says those trying times, when she lived in France, Spain, Belgium and the Ivory Coast, helped make her a better artist. And her Africa years are so important for her uh, in usage of color, light, and of course uh, she had to work, uh, she had the chance, the great chance to work with different body colors. And uh, so their, uh, their, their social activities, because social activities are, were so important and are still so important uh, for Eileen Eric. Uh, she feels herself as part of the society and she comes up uh, with lots of, um, I have to say, storytelling uh, and uh, using a very, very distinct aesthetic uh, on, on, on top of it. Storytelling is key for Orek, who wants to amplify her community's voice to the world while discovering firsthand the lived experiences of others. Adil Halim, TRT World, Ankara. Still to come on Showcase, Black is the New Black. Changing the conversation, the National Portrait Gallery is celebrating the achievement of Black Britons. Welcome to a garden of literary delights. We'll visit the Century Old Theatre in Buenos Aires, being praised for bringing a different kind of beauty to the world. Before we bring you those, here are a few stories that caught our eye, including a follow-up to a story we brought to you last week about the most controversial film at this year's Oscars. <laughs> The director of the Oscar-nominated short film Detainment is defending his movie and said he did not intend to upset any of the families involved. The film tells the story of two boys who murdered a toddler called James Bulger 16 years ago. It has sparked outrage since its nomination and an online petition for its withdrawal from the Oscars has gathered more than 200,000 signatures. The organizers of the Oscars won't withdraw the film, saying they want to remain impartial and abide by the Academy voters' choices. 
In Iraq, the Mosul Museum is opening its first ever exhibition since a large portion of its collection was destroyed by Daesh four years ago. Return to Mosul is displaying contemporary artworks by 29 artists and is the first ever exhibition held at the museum since the city was liberated from the terrorist group. The museum is also collaborating with Google Arts and Culture in a new project to recreate the artifacts that were destroyed by using 3D technology. Actor John Malkovich is set to star in a new play inspired by the scandal surrounding former Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein. Titled Bitterweed, it will be written and directed by Pulitzer Prize winning writer David Mamet and will explore how people in power inside the entertainment industry have behaved badly for decades. It premieres in London in June. Thirty-nine photographs of musicians, politicians, actors, activists and models, all British, all black. It's the National Portrait Gallery's largest acquisition of portraits of African and Caribbean people. Showcases Miranda Atty spoke to the artist and director behind the photographs, Simon Frederick. The thing that struck me, uh, I think, most was how lonely people felt, okay? They had achieved success, but they felt that they were alone, yeah? Because basically, I think, for black people achieving success, you are one person in an industry or one person somewhere, but you're not close to your other people. You don't understand that everyone else is actually going through the same things. Simon Frederick's four-part series, Black is the New Black, aired in 2016 as part of the BBC's Black and British season. It featured actors, journalists, politicians, activists and comedians, successful individuals from all walks of life, all in an effort to bring questions of race, identity, acceptance and belonging into the nation's consciousness. And now Frederick has donated the 39 photographs he took of his interviewees to the National Portrait Gallery. Whenever I came here, it was always surprising to me that some of, you know, the cousins of the family were missing. And I didn't understand why. Um, so I decided to do something about it. Um, so this kind of uh, series, Black as New Black, always was envisaged, uh, always started out live as an exhibition. Um, it was just when I started photographing the people, you know, when I, I think one of the first um, photographs I made was of Tiny Temper and then Laura Mvula. And it was hearing their stories, I thought to myself, no, I have to stop. Uh, and I started to write then, based on what they had told me, I started to write the structure of a, of a documentary series. He used the same criteria the National Portrait Gallery uses when deciding to include a piece. Has the person in question made, or will they make, a significant contribution to British life? And the portraits themselves are remarkable. All we ever see is white history. All we are ever promoted, all we are ever shown is white lives. Okay. Uh, and I, I think that that's, that's dangerous because it means that there are young children growing up in this country who are not white, okay, who, are, who feel excluded, okay. Now, these children are not immigrants and, and actually realise that there is, there is something about difference, yeah. Um, you know, we're all living on the planet together. We are all human beings. We all have differences, okay? But let's celebrate our differences, you know? and, um, you know, let's all live together. Sorry, can I show you this? Yes. And of course, there's a technological twist. So I've discovered another hidden bonus. I've downloaded the Black is the New Black app, which offers an augmented reality experience. All I have to do is scan the portrait that I'm looking at and clips from Simon Frederick's documentary appear. 
The portraits are on display until January the 27th. After that, they will become part of the National Portrait Gallery's permanent collection. As for Frederick, he's going from success to success, having recently aired his second critically acclaimed BBC documentary, Black Hollywood, They Gotta Have Us. Miranda Atty, TRT World, London. Let's take you to the perfect place to find your next great read. For a city known as the bookstore capital of the world, it's not surprising to be walking the streets of Buenos Aires and finding yourself walking into one of the dozens of temples dedicated to the written word. But there is one store that stands out. It used to be an opulent theatre, but these days the Al Ateneo Grand Splendid is entertaining visitors in an entirely new way. Take a look. Welcome to what's been called the most beautiful bookstore in the world. That's according to National Geographic, but it's not hard to see why. El Ateneo Grand Splendid in Buenos Aires used to be a theatre. The building with the air of a decadent Italian opera house was opened to public in 1919. The theatre was eventually converted into a cinema, but in the early 2000s transformed itself into a hub for book lovers. The bookstore gives a nod to its theatrical past, with the stage and its curtains still in place and its romantic style ceiling frescoes fully restored. The theatre's former seating area now contains El Ateneo's collection of more than 200,000 books. The old theatre boxes provide the perfect space for a quiet read. This is a classical style theatre that was inaugurated in the first half of the 20th century and throughout its history it held a cultural significance. Max Glucksmann, the man who built this theatre, was important throughout the 20th century for various forms of cultural expressions such as theatre, cinema, radio and music. It was a very thorough journey of culture and today the El Ateneo holds true to this with books. And it's not surprising that people come from all over the world to admire the store's opulence. I love books. Uh, in every city that we visit, we try to go to a bookstore, so we thought this is a perfect place to come to. Giving visitors a chance to admire the rich history of Buenos Aires, El Ateneo Grand Splendid is the perfect place to find your next great read. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Head to our YouTube channel for more from the world of culture and the arts. But let's wrap up our show by celebrating Stanley Kubrick. His directorial style was noted for its realism, dark humour and unique cinematography. And it was 55 years ago this week that one of his masterpieces, Dr. Strange Love or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb premiered. Here is a look back at how Kubrick came to be. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching and bye for now. armies have been destroyed by Spartacus. Toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Ruski.